can start together. Good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for joining us. We are really happy to take a further step in the journey of our International Symposium Future Design for uh, Knowledge Innovation. This is the second roadshow we have organized that will bring us to our plenary event that will take place uh, next 31st of March, where we'll we host international speakers coming from uh, universities, entrepreneurs, corporates and operators in the industry of knowledge. So we're going to explore diversifying point of view related to uh, knowledge learning innovation. So the first round will be about and will have a specific design perspective. The second will be focused on a point of view of cooperation. And the third one will be focused mainly on the experiences uh, we gathered in the region of Emilia Romagna. Please note that this will uh, be the single round, the only round that will be held in English, and the other one will be uh, in Italian. We can start with an amazing duo uh, talking about knowledge innovation from a design perspective. And uh, the first interview uh, will be related to a call to action for designers, which is actually knowledge innovation for us. And let me just introduce you the, the two people um, who are now sharing their point of view about knowledge innovation who are David Grossman and Mariano Alessandro. David Grossman is an environmental graphic designer focusing mainly on public and institutional projects. He has many years of experiences in design education as a lecturer, head of department, and head of school, and uh, he, he has been president of ECOD um, since, I think, 2017, if I'm not wrong, and as we presented ECOID on the Design Declaration Summit Steering Committee. Uh, David has also been actively supporting the development of the Chinese design industry infrastructure. So this is briefly his very huge career in, uh, in design. And Mariano leads the development of the Index Project Digital Platform and is an active member of education program of the Index program, um, program facilitating workshop around the world. He represents uh, Index Project at the Design Declaration Summit and also head of special project design and executing special custom projects with partners around the world. Um, he has an education background in system analysis, system engineering, history, and design-based education, a long experience as a developer, system designer, and a deep love for technology and design thinking. So thanks, Mariana and Devin, for joining us in this conversation. I would like to start with, um, with the question to Mariano. Um, we are now exploring the role of design in knowledge innovation. So uh, what's your personal definition about knowledge innovation, Mariano? Thank you, Valentina. And hello, everyone. Hello. Um, well, I mean, knowledge is power, right? So I think that the general definition goes something like uh, the, the right experimental research combined with the right development and the, the right empirical practices and I mean, that can generate the crucial knowledge that is needed for organizations to be ahead of the curve. But this being ahead of the curve is closely tied with this unstoppable growth mantra, right? That both governments, organizations, they seem to put above everything else. And I think it's this wild urge for growth is what has landed us in this tight spot that we as a civilization find ourselves in. And so I think it's more important to focus on innovating on the ways that we generate, that we accumulate and they propagate the knowledge and use design as the main driver to get the job done. And not just human-centered design, rather a multi-species centered approach with sustainability all around, with form, yes, but also considering the context, the impact, and what we at Index, uh, we call design to improve life. And of course, then injecting this new knowledge into organizations and governments, right, in an attempt to, to modify the, the growth KPIs and, and and put people and the environment first. That's great, Mariano. And I will pass the, the floor to David. Um, and I'm quite complicated in the question. Um, your definition, first of all, I would like to know also from you the definition of knowledge innovation, if you think this makes sense. Uh, and you will um, give us your personal opinion on that. And before, before giving us your opinion on knowledge innovation, what is for you today 
the definition of knowledge and the definition of innovation. So two questions in one, David. I'm not an academic. So my definitions are a little bit um, different perhaps than what you are using in the universities. Um, to my mind, knowledge in itself is, is always dynamic. It's always changing because knowledge is a natural system that is constantly upgrading itself. So I don't know if you can apply the term innovation as an act to impact knowledge intentionally. Um, I think there's a natural development of, of knowledge. Now, innovation is also something that I think has become, um, it, it, it's beginning to be almost meaningless because now everything that is new, simply new or different is called innovation. And I don't think that's what we mean by innovation. I think when we talk about innovation, the implication is something that is a value that has made a change. And I don't think innovation can be promised or delivered. It can only be um, recognized retroactively um, after it has proven itself. It's, it's today, I think innovation is used like you put new and improved on a soapbox. Um, and I don't think we, when we talk about knowledge, we should be applying um, new and improved to it because I think it undermines what knowledge is. And in terms of design, um, I think, I think um, the, the people, the professionals who call themselves designers um, have yet to properly define themselves as, a, as, as professionals. I don't think they always understand what it means to be a professional. And that's because the modern practice of designing is, is not very mature. I think it's only been um, uh, done uh, in the last 200 years and 200 years is not enough time to establish a professional ethos. I mean, if you take a profession like medicine and doctors, they've had 2000 years to establish a common ethos and the public has accepted that. Designers have yet to do that. And I think that's one of the challenges in front of us. Passing the, the ball to Mariano, um, we, we were talking about the index project why I was introducing yourself. The index design actually is a call to action. What is, according to you, the most urgent call uh, to action to design for designers to design the futures of knowledge and of learning, organizational learning. What do you think? Okay. Um, well, first, I think that the most important is to understand that not only our current ways do not work, but they won't change if we keep on doing the same things. So designers have been part of the problem for a really long time. Um, and in that way, I think it's now it's, it's time to be a part of the solution. I know it sounds cliche, but it's what it is. So we need to fundamentally change the way we prepare ourselves to interact and, and, and to shape our future um, in, in order to create one that not only is sustainable, but also responsible and fair. What do you think, David? I'm curious about your point of view. What is the urgent, the most urgent call to action for designers well, in the field of knowledge innovation? Well, first of all, I, I agree with, with Mariano, and I think it, it is tied to how the profession of designing has developed. Because over the past 200 years in the modern era, in the industrial era, designers became, um, they started by being the servants of producers that were taking advantage of the industrialization of technology to create products that people would consume. And, and they, without thinking too much about it, they made products and the more products, the better without taking into consideration the social impact, the environmental impact, um, uh, the cultural impact. And because of the economic system that has dominated our, our world for the past 200 years, 
designers were the servants of producers and they didn't think too much about it. And, and that controlled the way they worked and the way they thought. Um, but I think we are beginning to recognize today that that system doesn't work. As Mariano said, um, it's not sustainable on various levels, not only environmentally, but the, the social impacts and the cultural impacts of, of uh, an economic system based on consumption is not uh, sustainable. And designers, of course, are complicit in all the ills of that system. And we have to realize that. And all those little bits of plastic in the ocean have the names of designers on them. Um, now, according to the Montreal Design Declaration, which Mariano also knows very well, we have a sentence over there that designers better serve humanity uh, by being the ambassadors of the end users instead of the servants of producers. And if we become better the representatives, the ambassadors of the end user, um, we have the capacity to change concepts of consumption. And if we change concepts of consumption, we are doing a very important job. The schools have a critical role to play in teaching young designers what it means to be a professional. Very frequently in our schools, we focus on how to design. The first thing I think that the greatest challenge is that designers have to have a self-awareness of the role they have. I mean, before they even begin to design one thing or another, they have to understand that whatever design decision they make, even the most mundane, has all these repercussions that go far, far beyond the object or the message or the space they are designing. Every little, every design decision, no matter how small, not only has economic impact, but it has social impact and cultural impact, and uh, uh, it has environmental impact. Now I want to share an opinion uh, of Mariano related to what we always say. The best way to predict the future is to design it according also to you and to the, the index project. And uh, you have made such an interesting initiative, the, the Index Award Biennale, which is made of five categories representing human life from inside out, you say. Uh, the body, the home, the work, the play, and learning. So play and learning is actually a category, according to you, representing the, the human life. And the, for the learning categories, category, I saw that already about 300 projects uh, were, had been uploaded on your website. And uh, what do you think, according also to, to your experience and to the kind of projects that people have submitted to the, to the Biennale, uh, in which way can design contribute to the innovation of such an immaterial thing like knowledge innovation? And which are the main trends that you see in this field of learning and knowledge innovation? Learning, it still has a challenge, right? So learning has a challenge. Uh, it has a user. Uh, that user has a context. That context can be local. It can be global. Um, you can think of the curriculum of a, as a form, you know. So it, it, it's not longer so much, so much immaterial. So, you know, wh why not begin thinking of learning as, as a service design? Because if, you, if I say service design, then everybody can relate, you know? Oh, yeah, they can... Um, but how far is it, how, how different is it from service design? I mean, we always think of learning and this, you know, well, learning and this sense itself, but we can also uh, change it. We can also adapt it. And regarding what we see, you know, uh, it's basically a lot of different trends. We see a lot of skills, you know, mix of skills, uh, the skills of the future, you know, different applications, programs, books, uh, all kinds of, of, of projects that you can imagine, but that what they're doing is, um, it's about empowerment. It's about empowerment, inclusiveness. You know, when I look at the keywords, empowerment, inclusiveness, uh, open, sustainable, you know, um, and, and it can be uh, things like coding, uh, awareness, empathy. According to your experience and uh, to the projects you are leading, what is the, the attribute which is uh, more missing? 
among empowerment, inclusiveness, sustainability, and others that you mentioned? What we are missing more? It's hard to say. I mean, I would say it's the reach, right? Because usually all these projects, I see them really localized, centered in, in one particular area. And, you know, I, I think it should be really mandatory to when you begin designing something, how can you scale it? And not, not just making it big, how can you replicate what you're building in this center, you know, the center of Africa? How can, you, how can you replicate it in Latin America? So what I'm missing is this replication element. Let me give you an example, like the sustainable development goals. When I'm working with people and, you know, facilitating workshops, then development, sustainable development goals, they're just too big. You know, people, like, how am I going to solve no uh, hunger in the whole world? Okay, but you don't start in the whole world. Make it local, connect with your, you know, make it local, analyze the context, analyze your user and the solution that you're working there, perhaps it's not going to work somewhere else, but some elements will work. So it, I think it's about having small elements that you can mix and, and, uh, and match into creating a global thing. I also would like to ask to David uh, about his point of view of sustainable development goals, because I know he's, uh, he has a, a, a bit critical position related to the, the sustainable development goals. David, you want to well, share with us? Well, it, it's, it's not that I'm critical, but I think, I think the, the, in many cases, uh, and maybe it has to do with something that Mariano mentioned, the SDGs have become just logos, just little pins that you put on your shirt and, and, and people attend cocktail parties and talk about the SDGs. And, and I think it, it's become a slogan a little bit. I, 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 I'm a little bit uncomfortable with it. Um, I think that from, from ECOD, from the International Council of Design, when we think about designers and what it means to professional, to be a professional, we do change the resolution. And, and this is, again, Mariano and I are on the, same, on the same page. Every design that a designer works on, no matter how mundane, the smallest designer, the smallest design, it doesn't matter what it is, always has an impact in terms of the economy, in terms of society, in terms of culture, and in terms of the environment all of them, all the design decisions we make. And if, if a designer recognizes that every decision that they make many, many times a day have to be looked through those filters, and if they consider the implications of those filters, and if they consider that just as they are working in front of a, a computer screen on a particular design, there's another designer at the next desk and 10 more in the next room and a thousand more across the city and a million around the world who are doing designs individually. And if all of them share the professional responsibility of thinking about the social impact and the cultural impact and the stereotypes that, that, that they're creating and the the images of success and desirability that they're contributing to and the impact of consumption that all of us collectively are doing, if we become a, a band of, of designers who understand our responsibility, which is so great, I don't think there's any um, discipline that has more eventual impact than designers and we begin to operate differently then we have an impact. And we have an, an impact, by the way, on all those SDGs, because it has to do with materials and it has to do with consumption and it has to do with urban development and it has to do with social equity and it has to do with cultural diversity, but it doesn't come by solving hunger. You know, that, that's a big job for an individual designer to do. But if yes. every designer understands that every design decision they make 
impacts those things, then collectively we will have an impact. So uh, I think I think that's a very important um, introduction to a different approach to a different uh, professional standing. Considering that we are exploring the field of knowledge innovation, can we say that designers are actually defining the, 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 the knowledge and the culture of the society, the notion, the definition of culture of knowledge of the society and for the society? Well, I don't think they're, I don't think they're designing knowledge. I don't think you can design knowledge, but the, and, and design is an intentional process. Designing is a process where you have an intention and, and you achieve it. You try to achieve it. So I don't think that they intentionally design culture, but the sum total of all their designs is culture. <laughs> I mean, it, it, and it's been like that for since the beginning of history. It, if, if it, you know, it, human beings design, it, it's, it's what makes us different. We, we have the ability to apply our, to apply knowledge, to, in, in, to apply intention. And that's how we started creating tools and weapons and, and we invented all sorts of things and, and we developed all sorts of artifacts. And if you go to a museum and you look at ancient history, ancient culture, what you see over there are other artifacts. You, you see pottery and you see weapons and you see all sorts of things that are, that are designs. Now, they weren't created in a conscious way. Now, since the Industrial Revolution, designing has turned into a profession where we do it consciously. We have a process. We have an abstract process. And too much for too long, we have seen designers as um, their output um, is an artifact or a message or a space. But that is only a symbol of what they're really doing because they have become those people who define um, desire. They, they define success. They define what people want. They, they define um, prosperity. Um, and what they are actually doing collectively is they are creating abstract culture and abstract society, not only the physical and visual um, artifacts and messages that they're busy with. And that we have to be aware of that. What designers have to do today, again, is first to understand why we are designing, and then we'll learn about how to design. So, and the why, of course, is to make life better for human beings and to make a planet that we continue to live on. So we don't design society intentionally, but the sum total of our designs is very much culture. Mariano, uh, regarding your last uh, answer, I have two more questions for you. Um, according to you, which is the profile of the contemporary learner? If the contemporary learner is a persona, what, what, what features has this contemporary learner? And uh, you, you thought about a project which makes, uh, to get, brings together design thinking and STEM. And which are the main results that you, that you can um, observe and see from this project? Yeah. OK, but I mean, the learner, I would say that there are many different personas, right? Uh, because some people are motivated by uh, having a brighter future. Some people are motivated by just curiosity. And some people will be motivated by the idea of making a change. So I can tell you what my preferred persona would be, and it would be someone that is interested in changing, you know, of, of course, curiosity, because you need curiosity. You need to see, okay, these things are this way, but should they be like this? Can I make a difference? Can I, can I adapt? Can I make it a preferred outcome? Um, so I would say curiosity. I would say uh, getting out there, being, you know, independent. It's okay to be taught, but it's also good to learn yourself. Of course, asking the right questions and asking the right people. 
Um, and I see this more, you know, kind of do it yourself, which on the one hand, I, I can see how many people are, are going away from universities because you have so many free online courses. But of course, what you miss there is the network is, is discussing with your peers. Um, but I, in a way, I, I like this, uh, this open waterfall of information that if you want, you can just get it. Um, and the other question, Valentina, what, what, sorry. The evidence that you saw in applying design thinking to STEM. Okay, so what we're doing now is uh, with Siemens Stiftung, but before that, we were working with uh, different communities, municipalities here in Denmark. So we work with kids uh, from six years old to 17 years old. And the good thing about this project was that uh, there were many municipalities, but one of the really big municipalities, we trained all of the teachers. So the, the teachers, they were using our methodologies with kids in a period of three years. And it was really great to see how they were improving, how kids were you know, getting a responsibility sense and saying, okay, I'm seeing something wrong with my community and I can actually do something about it. So, you know, it's, it was actually integrating them and it, was, it wasn't something, uh, you know, rocket uh, space. It was uh, kids getting, looking out of the window and seeing that the community had problems and how could they solve it? Because all of these uh, projects uh, register and we have seen how kids that began thinking, you know, without any uh, boundaries, then they begin to incorporate all of these concepts and, and the solutions actually were better and better and better. So we can see that there is an impact and we can see that there is an interest and especially the kids think it's fun because thinking like, you no, know, they're, they're, they're learning by playing. Yes, the power of learning by playing. This is something I, I believe very much, yeah. very much. Thanks, Mariano. And David, what about you? Your personal description and portrait of the contemporary learner, which are the main attributes of the contemporary learner or of the learner in general? Well, I, I, I think that, um, I think that we, you know, human, human beings are learners. <laughs> so I don't know if the contemporary learner is any different than the learner 200 years ago or 2000 years ago or, or 250,000 years ago. I, I think that things are more accelerated now and that we have access Um, that that permits people to learn in a different way uh, and at a different speed. Mariano and David, thanks a lot again for your contribution during this conversation. Very, very interesting. And we will definitely keep in touch through the journey of knowledge innovation. Thank you.